Hey, welcome back everyone here to Veteran Nation, and we're going back to a very familiar format. Uh, we're going to do the one-on-one -on -one conversation interview again. And so those of you who've liked what we've been doing the last couple of weeks, don't worry, we're going to be mixing things up. But as always, I'm going to be telling all of you to go to www.nrnplus.com slash Veteran Nation. That's our landing page. You can subscribe to the network. You can support this show, support all the other great shows in independent content content creators here on new right network and uh as always you can go on to facebook you can find our veteran nation group you can join the uh conversation there just search veteran nation and we have our new youtube page where all of our archive is going to be put there completely for free so if you want to see old interviews that we've done we're going to be hanging them all up there now i'm going to get us started with today's guest we have sergeant q uh aaron kionis Welcome to the show. Well, hey, yeah, thanks, thanks for reaching out. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a great uh, honor to to be able to be on your platform and be able to to tell my story. And uh, so, thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming and joining us. And uh, we'd love to hear about all the things that you're doing because you're doing a lot of those exciting things. But uh, go ahead and tell us about yourself so that the audience knows, uh, you know, everything about you. Yeah, sure. So I um, I grew up in the mountains of of Northern California. And so in a small little mountain town called Mad River, uh, I think the graduating class was seven students uh, in 1997. And so it was really small and I grew up very, very rural life. Um, you know, we didn't have any power or running water in my house. My dad had built our house, but it wasn't, uh, it was very much what you would see like in a third world country where there's just some plywood up and some tar paper on the side, no shingles, no siding. Um, on the inside of the house, it was all framed out, but there was insulation and no drywall, no uh, lap siding or, or you know, a lap, lap and plaster, nothing like that on the inside. We had a, a wood stove and that's where we would cook, uh, mainly on the wood stove. Uh, we'd boil water um, to be able to take a bath and uh, it would heat the house. And we had oil lamps too, you know, for, for when it got dark. But that's just how I grew up, you know, grew up just living off the land. We had a big garden and we would hunt. And uh, our, <laughs> it's funny because I've seen, I've seen this, in this industry, my parents were pioneers in this industry, and I've seen this industry go from the Wild West to Main Street. So my parents were marijuana farmers. I grew okay. up in the heart of Humboldt County. And so they call it the Emerald Triangle, where it's um, Humboldt, Trinity, and Mendocino County. So I, I've grown up watching this industry go from the Wild West to Main Street. And when I mean the wild west, I mean the wild, wild west, where they California has a specific task force for marijuana. It's called CAMP, California Agricultural Marijuana Patrol. And so they would always be trying to, you know, catch our crops and cut them down. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's how we lived. And that's how I grew up. I'd get home from school and I'd be trimming buds. Like, that's what I did. You know, growing up in that lifestyle, um, I, I saw a lot of violence and drug use and, and experienced a lot of hardship. And for most people, um, that would hold them back in life. And it held me back for a really, really, really long time. But it only held me back because I refused to let go of it. I was stuck in this, what I call the victim mentality for a very long time. And uh, it took me many, many years to, to overcome that. So out of out of high school, we, we were, well, actually in my eighth grade year, um, because of my dad's drug use, he kicked us out of the house and we were homeless for about uh, four, four or five months. We were homeless living on the river. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a unique experience, man, to be homeless as a kid. It just, it's, uh, it does something to you, you know? And from there, uh, my mom, she moved us up to Coos Bay, Oregon. And that's where I was recruited, was out of Coos Bay, Oregon. And I joined the Marine Corps. And so I didn't really know much about the military at all. I grew up around all these hippies, you know, and some of them were actually veterans um, that had served in Vietnam, but I didn't know anything about the military. It was never talked about. I never had any military toys, anything like that. We had tons of guns, but they were for, you know, hunting and stuff like that, self-defense. But I didn't, didn't even know like what a tank was or different aircraft. I didn't grow up with any of that. But uh, I, I, I called myself the anti-hippie, I guess, because I wanted to go <laughs> as far opposite as I could. And so I figured I'm going to join the military. And so I researched the different branches. And, you know, the Marine Corps really appealed to me because 
you know, they're the baddest dudes on the block, you know? And so I was like, I want to be, I want to be one of these guys. And so I joined and I became a 2531, which is a field radio operator. Now I think they call it an 0621. But um, I did that because I wanted the flexibility to be able to work with any unit and every unit rates communications guys. And at a communication school, I got recruited to go to First Anglico, which is the Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Company. I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, <laughs> I don't think I would have said, yes, I'll try out if I knew exactly what was going to happen. Um, you know, the one of the instructors there at 29 Palms, his name was Sergeant Love, L-U-V. And I was going through school and he's like, hey, Q, you're pretty sharp. You, uh, you afraid of heights? I was like, no, Sergeant. He's like, all right. You want to go to Anglico and jump out of airplanes? I said, yeah, sounds great. <laughs> and so I said, yes. And then the next thing I know, I'm in Anglico going through this, through the ABC course, the Anglico basic course, and just getting, getting whooped every day, you know, just PT, PT, you know, learning, learning, learning. I, you're, you're a Ford observer. So you've got to call in air, artillery, mortars, naval gunfire. So you got to learn all those different systems. You got to do a yep. nine line brief. You've got to be able to call in helos to be able to extract wounded. Like there's so much to learn. Like artillery guys, right? 0861s, they're uh, they're a Ford observer, but they just work with artillery, bro. Like I'm doing artillery, I'm doing mortars, <laughs> I'm doing close air support, attack helo, nine lines, and I'm doing naval gunfire shoots, you know? So anyway, just a ton of information I had to cram into me. But I did really, really well because a lot of guys, when I went in the Marine Corps, they really struggle with the hardship of it because it, the military is a hardship. You mm -hmm. know, um, you don't have a regular work day. You're sleeping outside. Sometimes you don't have the right gear you need. And so that broke a lot of guys. But for me, bro, I grew up with nothing. I grew up with nothing. So it wasn't that bad of a hardship for me. Cause I, 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 I learned how to endure hardship when I was a kid. So that, that's what I talk about. Like I was stuck in that victim mentality of all these things that held me back. But once I let go of that, I realized that, hey, this is what can launch me farther into my future than I ever thought possible. And so I did really well in the Marine Corps. I became a master parachutist. Uh, I became the Naval Weapons Security Manager, a close combat instructor. You know, I've done cold weather packages at Bridgeport, which is the most miserable training I've ever done in my life, dude. Like, I hate that training. Horrible. Oh, I don't ever want to do that again. But I got to do a lot of really cool stuff, too. Um, I volunteered to go to Iraq in 2003. So I was getting out. I uh, was in the IRR. And the war was kicking off, so I volunteered to go. And I had lost a good friend of mine uh, in Afghanistan a year earlier. He was the first casualty in the war on terror from Oregon. And we went to high school together. And I actually was the guy who recruited him in to the Marine Corps. Uh, his name is Brian Bertrand. And his C-130, he was a navigator on a C-130. His, his C-130 went down over Afghanistan. And uh, so I volunteered to go, man. I figured I owed it to him to go fight. And so I did. And when I came back, man, I was really struggling with mental health. And it was so embarrassing for me because I, uh, I felt like I hadn't done enough to deserve to have PTSD. But man, I was having problems when I was in country. There's hypervigilance, which is kind of normal. And you kind of want that when you're out there on patrol. Like you, you're like, hey man, is that trash or is that it's like got wires in it? <laughs> you know? Like is that kid, what's that kid holding? Is that a broomstick or an AK 47? You want that hypervigilance, right? Yep. But when you get home, you don't need that anymore. But it's still right there. But I was having like nightmares and like disturbed sleep where I'd wake up like like ready to fight like huh like just I, I don't know like somebody was right there trying to kill me and so i jump out of a rack you know and um i was just dealing with, with your heart racing you know that's yeah. a to most people that adrenaline just pumping through my veins and and i was dealing with that there you know but i didn't really think much of it i got home and it just got so much worse you know i was having um audio hallucinations and ptsd and it really just it caused me a tremendous amount of problems i mean i, I got divorced because of it which is 100 percent my fault i wasn't managing my mental health i was fired from multiple jobs and i ended up being homeless again you know because i wasn't managing my mental health and i went to the va and i tried to get help but honestly during that time, I know the VA's changed, but during that time, it was terrible. I was one of those guys that fell through the cracks, man. 
and I tell this story and sometimes people don't believe me, but I'm telling you, like, this is exactly what happened. I would go to the VA and I'd say, Hey, I need help. And they'd, I talked to a psychiatrist and then I talked to, they'd give me medication, which was over medicating me. And then I talked to a psychologist and he would, you know, do some counseling. And then I'd get a bill in the mail to pay for that service that I got. And I'm like, I'm not paying this bill. Like I signed a contract that said you guys would take care of this. So I wouldn't pay it. Well, at the end of the year, when I get my tax return, they'd snatch it up. And so then I wouldn't get my tax return. And that happened to me a couple of years in a row. And one year, that's what actually caused me to become homeless because I was depending on that money and I, uh, it got snatched up and I ended up, ended up being homeless. And so I don't have a whole lot of warm and fuzzies about the VA just because my experience was so brutal. And I know other guys have had different experiences, but mine was not good at all. There aren't many veterans I know who have a lot of warm and fuzzy about the VA. I've, I've struggled with them a lot of, I would say maybe one in 10 are like, no, I had, I've had nothing but positive experiences. Most people have had to, had to fight, had to argue, you know, had to, you know, just generally be not nice for things that, you know, we should absolutely have. Yeah, it, it was it was really difficult for me for sure, and it caused a lot of more a lot more hardship in my life um, than than it should have. I thought, but um, yeah, man. So mental health was just a huge huge struggle for me, mm-hmm. and I it got to the point where I I became suicidal because I just wasn't managing it. And I remember I it was the Fourth of July, and I hadn't slept in a couple of days. I was having audio hallucinations. And, um, I just figured, you know, I'm done with this. I'm going to just check it out. I'm going to end my life. And so I drove around and I found this large vacant parking lot and I was like, this is perfect. I'm going to go here. And so I did, I drove in that parking lot and I backed my truck up, right? Or I had a Dodge Durango. I drive, I backed it up against the building and, uh, I was sitting there and it's the 4th of July in the, in the Northwest. So it does get a little warm and, uh, I could feel the heat kind of coming through the window and I was like ah I'd already shut the car off I was like all right I'm just gonna open the window so I opened the window and to get a little bit of breeze to come through and I could hear these kids playing on a playground not too far away and I thought to myself well I'm just gonna wait I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna shoot myself and then have these kids walk up on me you know I'm gonna wait and so I did I waited and waited and waited and next thing I knew I fell asleep and when I woke up those suicidal ideations were gone so I put my pistol away and went on about my day. A little weird feeling, but I, I did. A couple of days later, a friend says, Hey man, you want to go to church with me? I was like, nah, I'm not into that, bro. Like religion. Like that's, I don't even think there's a God, like no thanks. And he says, well, here's the address, man. It'd be cool if you came on Sunday. And uh, I remember I woke up that Sunday and I was a little hungover and I looked at that address and I was like, I'm going to go check it out, man. What do I got to lose? So I went to the address and I drove in the parking lot and it was that exact same freaking parking lot that I had almost committed suicide in just a few days before. And so, bro, that was like one of the most surreal experiences of my life. I was like, what is happening right now? Like, this is crazy. And so, but now the parking lot is packed with people. So I went in and I listened to the pastor and I swear it felt like he was reading my mail because he was talking about feeling lost and alone and worthless and hopeless. And I'm like, this is me. This is all what I'm dealing with right now. And so uh, went to church two or three times and, you know, he gives the altar call. And so if you don't know what that is, that's where they say, hey, if you want to receive Jesus, you know, come forward. And so I did that. And I thought, okay, great. Like all my problems are going to be solved. Perfect. So I go and do it but nothing changed for me. I was still dealing with the anxiety. I was still having panic attacks, all these problems that I was having. And, uh, but I knew there was something there, right? Like I I was like, there's something here. Like it's just too weird of a coincidence to happen. So I kept going and I met with some guys there and I started doing a small group study and reading the Bible and understanding it and trying to figure out who God is and what does this mean? And at the same time, I was reading a lot of medical journals, trying to figure out how does the brain operate? Because the VA really was no help. And anytime I went to an appointment, I would be giving them more questions than they could give me answers. Because I'm reading the medical journals and I'm asking them like, hey man, you want to give me this medication, but these are all the side effects. And 
that's the exact same symptoms that I'm having. So why would you give me a medication that's causing the same side effects as what you're trying to prevent? Can we try this other thing? Or what about this therapy? Or can we do this? And so I didn't feel like they were giving me much help at all. And I ended up just self-diagnosing and reading medical journals and figuring out how the brain operates. At the same time, I was reading the Bible and I found that these two things correlated, man, that, that what science is proving the Bible has been telling us for thousands of years. And I was just like, aha moment. I was like, this is crazy. So I'd write all this stuff down in this journal. You know, I'm like, this is amazing. Science says this, the Bible says this. So how do I, now I have this concept, what do I do with it? And I'd create an action plan and I would journal out my results and be like, okay, that didn't work out. Let me try this. Oh, that works out better. And I created this little program for myself. And by doing that, um, like I said, I was, I, I had lost my job. And so I'd started a little tiny janitorial company, me and one other guy scrubbing toilets in the middle of the night. And, uh, by utilizing this program that I put together, I, this is 13 years ago. And now I employ over 105 people in the Pacific Northwest. So my janitorial company, uh, has grown exponentially by utilizing this program that I created. Uh, so I have the, the janitorial company. I also own some commercial property in downtown Auburn, where my headquarters is. I have a 10,000 square foot building there. Um, then I took this and I created a nonprofit to help other veterans. It's called Q Missions, where I take guys. Um, oh, so I, I, I take guys and I put them through this program and it helps them uh, the same way that it helped me. And so my church, they asked me uh, to go to Mexico. To, to build a home for a homeless family. And I was like, ah, I don't know if I really want to do that. That seems like a lot of work, but I did it. And what I learned was that there was healing through serving other people. And I was able to quantify that with the uh, medical journals that I was reading that show that there's, there's a cool, um, uh, it's one of the first experiments they did in this area. It's called the Mother Teresa effect. And since then, there's been hundreds of other studies that have replicated this. But basically, they just watched Mother Teresa do good works in Calcutta, and then they measured their, um, the, the chemicals that their brain was releasing. And they could show that just by watching her do these works, that they had increased mental wellness. Now, other studies have gone farther and had people receive help or give help. And the people who receive help, they get minor mental health benefits. But the people who are giving the help, they have this explosion of um, uh, positive mental health chemicals pumped into their brain as they're helping people. So it's just the way that God designed us. He designed us to be in community and to help one another. And so we get more mental health benefit when we're helping others. And so now I, take, I created Q Missions and I take veterans down to Mexico. And in two days, we'll build a home for a homeless family. And it's a nonprofit. Nobody gets paid, not even me. Uh, 100% goes back to veterans, uh, getting them through this program. I, I put about 40 guys through the program per year. It's just all I can afford right now. My janitorial mm -hmm. company picks up the majority of the cost for that. But we take, that, uh, we take them through this program and we teach them there's healing through service. I created a curriculum teaching them everything that I learned out there. And then I just, I like these guys on fire and set them loose on the world, man. And I watch these guys do amazing things. It's, it's, it's super cool. We've, we received a couple different awards from the department of veterans affairs for our work. And then in 2017, I was named Seattle's hometown hero for this program. And so one of the, one of the really cool stories from that is a guy named Patrick Wright. And he's out of Coos Bay, Oregon. We, uh, we were friends in high school and we went into the Marine Corps together on the buddy program. And years later, I reconnected with him and I said, Hey man, you got to go through this program. I'd already been running it for like a year. Like you got to come through. And he did reluctantly. And he was on suicide watch when he went through, um, he went through and when he got back, man, the dude was on fire. He's like, I want to do more. And so we helped him start his own nonprofit where he was helping the aging veteran population just do repairs on their house. But uh, he's, he's over the last year and a half, he's transitioned to housing homeless veterans and he's done such a good job at it that, that Oregon gave him, I want to say it's like a $3 million grant or something to wow. house homeless veterans. Cause he's just killing it out there, man. I mean, and that's what happens. It's, it's when you learn these things, these fundamental things uh, of how the brain operates. And when you start to get in a slump, you start to feel depressed. You're like, okay, I know I need to do a, B and C. 
So what I learned is the brain is like a weapon. It's in, in, in mental health, when you're going through a mental health crisis, the brain is just malfunctioning. And so we have to do a remediate action drill and get it back in the fight. So that's what I teach people to do. It's, it's, it's really simple. And so the book that I wrote, it details out all of this because I can only put so many guys through my program. So I wrote the book and I started a small group curriculum that you can do solo online by yourself, or you can do it with a group. And I really, really, really want guys to do it as a group uh, because there's such power and strength in that small unit. Um, Let's see. The Department of the Army did a 40 year long study and they determined the number one factor for success on the battlefield is the squad because every member of the squad values the squad over themselves therefore they fight harder and longer to stay alive because they yep. don't want to let the squad down so when we leave the military we lose our squad and so i help guys recreate that squad and this small group study is a great way to do that because at the end of the book everything that you've learned i basically mr miyagi you through the whole process right just paint the fence why do i paint the fence? just paint the fence and then you start to realize as you go through it like oh that's why we're doing these things and i i these concepts um when you do the practical application you're proving to yourself that they actually work you're not just reading it but you're doing it and you're recording the results in a journal so you see it in your own life start to transpire and it's really cool to watch guys just come alive when they start to figure this stuff out man and uh it's i mean and 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 me too right like when i watch guys like having success and and going after it i'm like yeah man go for it like do it and so it's uh it's really cool to to watch guys do that um it just creates their creates mental resiliency in their life, you know, and it gives them a chance to be empowered. It's fantastic. You know, a lot of the things you're talking about are absolutely speaking to me. You know, um, I've struggled with PTSD. I've talked about it on this show. This show has helped me so much deal with so many of the problems because, you know, doing this show, I've, I've had veterans reach out to me and say, Hey, I'm, I'm really struggling with this, or I need help with this. And just being able to say, you know, well, I can, I can help you with that because I've had someone on my show contact these people or you need to do these three things, you know, to, to do if you're looking for, you know, a government job or something or, you know, if you're dealing with a VA claim, I'm, I'm you know, I'm helping people try to connect. And that has helped me tenfold. So... Isn't that amazing? I love that. I love that. See, I'm not the only guy that figures this out, man. There's a, I'm a janitor by trade. Okay. So I'm not like, uh, I have no college degrees. I don't, you know, I'm not a psychologist. Like I'm just a janitor who read some books, man. And and was like, Hey, this makes sense. So it's so cool when I talk to other guys like you who figured it out, you know, it's super cool. And so the one thing I would tell you is to um, write that stuff down, those wins, And so that's one thing that I started doing because I can really get down on myself. Like, why am I doing this? You know, is it really worth it? I'm, you know, because something's really hard. I'm struggling with something. I go back to that journal and be like, this is the, 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 you know, good job journal, I call it. And these are all the emails that that people have sent me about how I've helped them or text messages that they sent me or write-ups in the paper or whatever it is, like all these things. I'm like, oh yeah, I am helping people. You're right. Okay. Because in our brain, we have what's called a negative bias. And this thing is, it was great when God originally designed it because it's to keep us alive. Right. And so if uh, we went out and we ate a pink berry and we got sick the next time, we went out and ate that pink berry, we'd be like, oh, I, I, I don't want to eat that because it's going to make me sick. And so it's a survival instinct that God gave us, but uh, it, can, it, it can be detrimental as well. And so people are like, well, what does that mean? So think about, so the listeners out there, think about what was the alcohol that you got sick on when you were a kid? So what was it for you? Uh, for me, vodka. Vodka, okay. <laughs> and so- the next time somebody cracked open some vodka, like it just made your stomach do somersaults. Can't right? drink it till even this this day. It's not my thing. <laughs> yeah, me too. For but it's black velvet. Was, was the only me. time I've ever ordered vodka was uh, in Moscow. I went to Moscow for a weekend just because I wanted to see it, and I was like, okay, I'm in Moscow. I've got to do a shot of vodka. So I went to a bar, ordered a shot of vodka. Did did vodka in Moscow? 
had to force it down, but that was it for me. <laughs> <laughs> that is your negative bias, right? Your, it, your brain says, no, this is going to kill you. Don't do it. And so that's good because it can keep us alive, but it can have negative effects as well. So if, Mike, if you and I, if we have a negative interaction, it's going to take uh, or six positive interactions just to get us back to normal not even to build a relationship, just to be normal, have a normal friendship. And so think about that in your life with your spouse, with your friends, with people that are now your enemies. It only took one or two negative experiences for you to just totally write them off. And so that's the negative bias. That happens to us with a lot of things. You know, people uh, have a negative experience in Iraq, um, you know, around like, uh, you know, children on the freeway. And so they don't want to drive on the freeway anymore avoid it it's just too close to that they don't want to touch it so i teach people in the book how to overcome this negative bias how to build positive memories and interactions around oh. looks like we lost them i'm gonna go ahead and pause this and see if we can get them back oh there. That, i lost you for a second Are you back i i can't hear you All right, I'm back. That was your back. <laughs> okay. So, so with the ne so the negative bias, um, what it does is it it helps keep us alive, right? Yep. And so, absolutely. Able to build positive, uh, positive memories around something negative. PTSD is all about survival. It is. It is. And so, uh, I help people do this. And so, for me, going to there's so many negative experiences like going to mexico and building a house for a homeless family there's so many things in there that i was like no way number one it's on memorial day weekend and that was my time to go get drunk and think about the guys that didn't come back with me right and so i didn't want to do it because of that i didn't want to go to a foreign country i definitely didn't want to go to a foreign country without a weapon and I didn't want to do anything with homeless people because I'd been homeless a couple of times. So when you talk about homelessness, it freaked me out. I was like, oh, no, I don't want to deal with that. And so I didn't want to do it. But when I went, it was the first time that I actually felt something in a long time because PTSD just made me totally numb for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I actually like felt something. I was like, oh, wow. OK, I can. I need to come back and I need to do more of this. And the more that I did, the more positive experiences I had around homelessness and Memorial day. And now I can talk about those things and not shy away from them, not have that, that trauma response. And so I teach people in the book, how to do that in their own life. Now it, it, this, uh, from my own experience, I know everything that you're talking about, it all works. So anyone watching out there, you know, this is, we always say we take care of our own, taking care of a brother or sister, you know, brother or sister in arms, that, that's going to help you get through the hard times. So absolutely, this, I've heard so many people say this. So you're, you're right over the target. Um, I do want to make sure, because uh, we do have to, I don't want to go too long. I do, we are going to have to wrap up, but I do want to make sure you get all your plugs of everything that you're doing. And I want you to talk about, you uh, your book, uh, talk about any social media that you have, and also how can other veterans, if they want to take part of your program, how can they reach out? Absolutely. That's, that's great. Um, so my nonprofit is Q Mission. So you can go to qmissions.org. You can sign up to go on one of these trips with me. Uh, if you're not ready for that, it's totally fine. You can go to healingthroughservice.com. And okay. that's where you can order the book. You can get the book on Amazon Target anywhere, but you can go there and get the book and you can sign up to do this small group curriculum. You can go through it solo on your own if you want, but I highly recommend you do it with a group. And I'm actually going to start teaching it here um, later in the fall. I think there's some dates that you can sign up for and I'll actually walk through this six week long series with you. You can sign up for that. And if you use the promo code uh, podcast, then you'll get a discount um, at checkout. So you'll be able to, to do that as well. And one other thing you, you can, you can find me on, on everything, sergeantq.net, Sergeant Q on Facebook, uh, Instagram, YouTube, you can find me out there. I'm all over the place. Quick Google search. You'll find it. But one thing that I'm working on right now, that's super exciting. It's called Q actual. 
And so it's a suicide prevention app that we created that's currently undergoing medical trials in North Carolina. And okay. it's set to end here in October. And we have had a 100% success rate with this app. So it's super exciting. So if you guys want to stay up with that, um, you can check that out as well. No, that's all great. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, I love your stories. I uh, love what you're doing. Uh, I know you're doing way more. So I, I'm going to give you an invite. You want to come back and talk about everything else. You have an open invitation. Just reach out to me. I'll have you back on. And also any of the other veterans that you work with, if they're doing something cool, shoot them my way. We'd love to have them on the show. Yeah, fantastic. I, I definitely will. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send Pat a message and get you guys linked in. I think it'd be great. That, that would be amazing. And uh, for everyone joining us, again, I'm just going to remind you uh, to go to www.nrnplus.com slash Veteran Nation. Uh, search us on YouTube, Veteran Nation. Uh, you can join our Facebook group, Veteran Nation. Uh, that's all the same. You can find me at Twitter, I'm at VetNationNRN. And uh, for all of you, thank you for joining us today. And again, Thank you for being worth serving.